So thanks for coming. My name is Joe DeLuca. I'm on the planning committee for the web conference here. And we are here for a session called, as you can see right there, performing better and provisioning less with caching. Uh, some basic things to be aware of. Yes, turn your cell phones off. Um, the other thing is don't forget to do the evaluations. If you don't do it today, um, do it soon. Web conference at PSU.edu. There's a place there to evaluate and you'll need this session number. This is G5, not T3, but you're not gonna remember it anyway. It's on this paper. Just remember that the number's on this paper. So keep this with you and that way you'll be able to fill out the code. Um, so with all that said, uh, please help me wel welcome Jason Fish. My name is Jason Fish. I manage a team of developers and designers at Purdue University. We build web and mobile applications for uh, our, our central IT unit and serve teaching and learning throughout the university. So we build sites and apps. Sorry, some reason that work. This one's not working? Sorry about that. You're throwing my whole thing off. I apologize. <laughs> I forgot what you do already. <laughs> So let's try that again. My name is Jason Fish. I work for Purdue University, Central IT Unit, um, in the teaching and learning area, building web and mobile solutions for faculty and students um, around campus. What I'm going to talk to you today, to you today about is caching. But before I get to caching, does anybody has anybody ever heard of the slash dot effect? It's when yeah, there we go. Your slash dot slash dot user back in the day. Absolutely. Very good. So it's uh, it's an older it's an older saying, where larger sites such as slash dot FARC, or does anybody remember DIG when it was actually used, would link to smaller sites that had some interesting piece of content. Everyone would go to that smaller site and you get a result that looks like this. Today you see it's still happening with things like Facebook, Twitter, Reddit. Some person posts a, a link to a cool animated GIF and then the site take, is taken down and you can't get to it except for using Google Cache. So we have something similar in higher education. We have what I like to call the semester or the syllabus effect, <laughs> where excitement and worry at the start of the semester causes a massive increase in traffic. So I noticed this very much in one of our apps. The week before classes started, hardly anybody was in there using it. The first week, as you would expect, there's a huge jump in traffic. And then throughout the rest of the semester, traffic continues to decline. It's not because your app necessarily or your site is bad. It's just that students are smart. They know how to use it more effectively as the semester progresses. As technologists, we have to understand, as developers or as web administrators, we have to know what our infrastructure is capable of handling. So we have to handle that point up there at all times. We, we, we can't build our infrastructure to handle this, or can't handle our code, can't write our code to handle that. We have to, we have to handle the spikes. So the syllabus effect is the first example. The second is the assignment effect. When an online assignment is due, it causes a massive increase in, in traffic. If, if anybody's ever experienced this, I, I, I apologize. This is, this is the worst. We had this um, in the past where an assignment was due with a large class. Everyone went to it the last hour or two that it was due. The site went down and crashed. You do not want that to happen. You get this. <laughs> Has anybody ever had faculty or students come to them like this? It, it is, it's the worst. So, so what can we do? Um, we, don't want to, we don't want to have to build up our infrastructure and buy all, this, buy all these servers to handle all these spikes and then not use that infrastructure when, it's, when, when those spikes are no longer there. So we can help to curb those spikes um, with caching. Well, I'm not quite there yet. This lady's probably saying, performance is a feature, and just like any other feature, it must be continually monitored. Yeah, she's probably not. That was actually the um, Mozilla's community platform manager. So that's how uh, our team likes to look at performance. Is it's just like any other feature on the site. If, you don't, if, you, if your site doesn't perform, then, students, then people aren't going to use it. Students, faculty, anyone. Marissa Meyer, when she was still at Google, found out that whenever they implemented a new feature in the Google search um, Google search results page, that when that, that new feature was added, it went from an average speed of 0.4 seconds to 0.9 seconds. Still very, very fast, but what they found was a 20% decrease in traffic because of that half second extra. So every little bit counts. So how can we, how can we do that? First, I'd like to explain 
uh, a simple interaction. We all know here, so we're all on the same page. A user wants to get to your, univers your university homepage, and your university homepage has the list of current events, you know, what's happening here on campus. The user makes the request to your application server. Your application server says, okay, what's the data? Pass it, the, the database passes back the response. Application server wraps it up in some pretty HTML and passes it back to the user. Everybody understands that, right? The next time somebody comes to that, wants to get that university homepage, they again make a request to the application server. The application server asks for the same data from the database. The database passes the exact same data back to the application server, and the application server again wraps it up the same data in the same HTML and passes it back to the user. You get it here, I don't have to go through it a third time. But what happens when you have a bunch of users all come to your site at the same time? Well, without caching, you have the same application, the application server asking again for the same data, but this time all at the same time. And the responses come back all at the same time. And it puts a real load on your server. So what we want to do with caching is take, take it down to one request for the data and one response of the data. This is what we call database caching, where you're saving the results of your database query so they can be used in the future. Pretty simple concept. All right, but what it, what it means in reality is that instead of having a database server that has to be enormous or multiple database servers with a lot of memory, with a lot of processing power, um, you can have a much smaller database that can handle these spikes without going down. Uh, one example where we had this happen was with our, uh, one of the tools called Hotseat. What Hotseat is is a micro collaboration tool um, for the classroom. It allows faculty in large lecture, large lecture courses uh, to be able to talk about personal finance, get thoughts back from their students in real time in class, and then they can have that discussion of, well, what would be considered a good interest rate? They can get questions back from their students without having the students to having to raise their hand in front of their two or three hundred classmates in a big lecture hall. Um, so what we found is when these large lecture classes would happen and they'd use hot seat, our database was just getting destroyed. We were getting hit and hit hard and the, it was slowing the site down to where faculty didn't want to use it for their students anymore. So we implemented some caching um, and in one test we found that over the time period we went from almost 300,000 database queries to less than 9,000 database queries by simply caching 10 queries. That's all we had to do. Um, is, and it allowed us to see a 97% reduction in, in the number of queries. That is, that is just astounding to me, the, the, the amount we saved. That means that we could not only handle these large lecture courses, but we could handle more of them at the same time without having to buy more infrastructure, without having to buy more database servers, you know, bigger bandwidth, and nothing like that. We could stick with what we had and continue to grow and get larger. And the next example, um, Mixable is a tool that uh, allows uh, students to interact in a Facebook-like discussion area uh, centered around their classroom. And so this same, same thing too, we had our growing pains as, it, as the site got used more and more, it started to slow down. So we implemented caching again. By just, talk, by just caching one query, the most used query, we saw dramatic improvements. And when we cached just our top six queries, we saw enough to make our, we have no longer, no longer have any uh, request timeouts. So it's a, it's a very simple thing. It's not something that you have to do for all of your queries. It's not something that you have to do um, all the time, you need to find what's most important and concentrate on that. So once you have what's most important, then it's a matter of actually implementing caching. So we'll go over some examples here. We'll, we'll start with C-sharp. In C-sharp you have your, your function, you're getting a person by their ID. Very common function, we all know there. Uh, first thing you try to do is get it out of cache. .NET provides you a caching class that provides a number of different functionalities. I'm, get, I'm starting with the simple ones of getting it, and if it's not in there, then you go get it from the database and put it into the cache. So the very first time this function is ran for a particular ID, a person ID, it will, it will be null, go get it from the database and put it in the cache. The next time this function is ran with the same ID, 
it will get it right out of um, right out of the cache. So you don't have to make that request like we were talking about earlier, um, again and again and again, no, no matter how many people are asking for it. And you return the user just the same. Any questions about the .NET code? What's up? How long is that cache stored and does that become part of the uh, session bag or? Great question. Um, so what, what I'm not showing here is all, are all the other things you can set within the cache. Um, how long it's stored, what its, what its dependencies are. So there's definitely more in that cache class that you should investigate, but for the purposes of this session, I wanted to keep it very simple, and you could write this code right now, and it would work. But good question. Uh, next, we'll talk Cold Fusion for your Cold Fusion guys out there. Um, you have your very simple CF query with your name and your data source, but an additional attribute here is cached within. So what this tells the the Cold Fusion server is that if this if this query was hit in the last six hours, don't don't go ask for it from the database. Get it directly from the cache. And you have your query like you normally would with your CF query param. Cold Fusion guys, questions on that? Simple enough, right? Something you could leave this session right now, go back, add it to your most hit pages, and see an improvement in ten minutes. For data that's static over a period yeah, of time? So if we have data that changes constantly, we can't really cache a query. That's, that's a very good point. So data that, that changes rapidly, um, that's data that you, not, you wouldn't necessarily want to cache because it changes so rapidly. Um, but your events on a home page probably isn't changing every couple minutes. But you can even, even for data that changes rapidly, you might cache it for the next 10 minutes or the next 20 minutes or the next that, an hour. You know, you can, you can make that time whatever is important for your particular piece of data. Some data may not change for a month, or if it does, you don't really care. Make sense? Yes? So, with Cold Fusion, great question. The question was, how does it know it's in the cache? The, with Cold Fusion, it goes by the name, um, the data source, and the actual query string as well as any uh, parameters that are, that are provided. So it, Cold Fusion kind of takes care of that for you. Whereas in .NET, you saw I created that name. Cold Fusion, that's, that's part of what it provides. Did I see a hand up over here, too? I, I was kind of the same question. I, I guess I was, so simply by assigning those three attributes at the top, you're creating the cache. Correct. The first time that the query is run. Yes, the question was if the three attributes up here um, create it in, in the cache, and, and yes, that is true. Th those are the attributes you need at a very minimum to create that in cache. All right, in PHP, it's very, very similar. You have your connection, you create your SQL statement. Uh, this enable switch is a PHP constant that tells PHP that it, can be that it can be cached or to look in cache for this particular query. And you output your results and free up your space. PHP guys? All right, so what we've done is we've made our, our interaction look like this. Instead of asking the database for the, date, for the data each time the page is requested, we're asking for that data once and we're, we're responding only once. Now I, I have, a, have something to admit. Um, I lied to you guys. Um, this interaction isn't that simple. So I explained it as being your user requests a page and the application server responds with your page. And it's, and it's really not that simple. As an example, uh, I pulled Stanford's homepage up here. Anybody from Stanford? Good. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to call you out right in the middle here. So with Stanford's homepage, I used a, a Chrome extension called YSLO, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And I could see that beyond just the HTML that you're asking for, the user's asking for four JavaScript files, six style sheets, and 11 background images. So that's 21 extra requests that the user is making to your application server and 21 responses that the application server has to give back to the user. So instead of this, now we have this. And again, this is a perfect place for caching. So what can we do? Oh, but before I, before I explain what we can do, um, just so Sanford's not getting mad at me, I went out and grabbed a couple other uh, home pages 
and found that we're all doing it, right? And you, you really have to, if you think about it. Every, whenever you're, you're getting a page, you're not just re returning plain HTML. You have images, you have JavaScript, you have CSS that, you're, that, that you need that user to get to display the page correctly. So it's not as if you can, the first time they want your page, they, they only need one request. You, you can't get around that. But you can use expires headers. And expires headers tell the client to use the cached version of a component, a CSS file, uh, an image, JavaScript, um, until some date in the future, some, some date you specify. So how did we, so uh, what that does is the first request looks like this. It still has to go make those 21 requests and send back 21 responses. But the second, but the second time that page is requested, you make one request and have one response because the user already has all the other elements. So we'll go back to our Mixable example. In Mixable, we allow our, our, our students to, to post URLs. You know, they want to share a URL to some cool piece of information. We go out and grab that URL screenshot and show it to the user in a more visual, friendly uh, way instead of just, here's the link. Um, so we have a page that shows all of these URLs and all of these um, screen grabs. What we found was this page was not the fastest. You know, we're going out and getting we, 53 images um, and, and bringing those back to the user. So what we did is we implemented the expires header. And what you can see is the first time that page is requested, there's 57 requests. So if the user asks for 57 specific things from the application server, and the application server sends 57 things back. That has 435K, which isn't huge, but it's still maybe more than we have to send. Um, and you can see what it breaks down to. The second time, when you have that cache is primed, we, we by using the expires header, it takes it down 93% of the HTTP, HTTP requests. We're not quite down to one yet, but it was, a, it was a great improvement for the little amount of code we had to do, and 98% less weight. So the second time a user goes to this page, they only have to request these particular items, um, and it's a lot faster load time for that end, for that end user. And it, what it also means is just like the database could be smaller, your application server can be smaller. You're not sending out, um, you're not getting the same amount of requests and you're not having to respond with the same data over and over and over again. You let the user who already has that information use that information. So again, we're going to go over it in our three languages. Uh, for .NET, there's this client cache tag that you put in your web config. Now this can go in your, uh, the web config at your, the base of your site or within any folder uh, that, is, uh, that you have. So if you want to uh, set a different date for your CSS than you want to set for your images that you want to set for your JavaScript, your JavaScript probably changes uh, not as much as your CSS and maybe not as much as your images. So you can set different times that make sense for those different types of elements. Any questions from the .NET guys? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Or you can just have it one at the base and set the same expires header for, for all of that static content. Good question. ColdFusion, there's actually a CF header tag that you can uh, set the expires header in. And so right here, you set the expires header with CF header. You, and then what I'm doing here is going and grabbing an image and sending it back out to the user with this expires header. Very simple. You can, if you had this in maybe your CF application uh, or your application.cfm or CFC, then it could do this for all of your content. Any questions from the Cold Fusion guys? And lastly, we'll look at PHP. Again, you have this header. Um, when you set the expires, and I'm setting it for the offsets in seconds, and there's 60 seconds, 60 minutes, 24 hours, 14 days. So you're setting this, this particular header in PHP f for 14 days. Yes? Sorry. Question. No, continue, please. In the ASP.NET example, why did you have the date set to 2038? So the, so the, the question was on the .NET example, why did I have the date set to 2038, a date I picked? Um, you can set it to whatever you want. You can, you can set it to um, 
what that what what that is considered as a far future date. That's a date that the user is never going to hit without having you know hit. So what you're effectively telling uh, the user's browser never come get this file again until 2038. Okay. So you you can set it in a month from now, in an hour from now, or in 2038. So it'll never be hit. Good question though, and you can do that with PHP with um, ColdFusion, ASP.NET, and any other languages. I'm sure Java has something very similar. Uh, the one thing to note is that when you set your expires header, it has to have a particular format. So it's very important you can't just specify, how, specify it however you want to specify it. It has to have a particular format to, to be able to be read. Yes? Is the browser no cache and those kind of things override the languages? There are a number of browser rules. There are there, there's the expires header, there's the um, cache control header, um, there's the no cat, there's, so there's a lot of different things. The only thing I wouldn't use is the meta tag. Browsers don't really care about your meta tag. That in the browser, when your properties don't cache anything, does that override it? So if you personally set no cache, yes, then, then what you set on your own browser overrides this. So if you ever um, want to always get the freshest content, or you even do a hard refresh in your browser, it will override this, these settings and go get everything again. Yeah, I wanted, just want to make sure, the, you, you have that weight, you know, those two bar graphs and everything, or the pie chart, excuse me. Yes. The first one was the, um, initial. the first one is the initial one where you're always on the initial request, mm -hmm. that's the weight it's going to be, and then the subsequent requests are only, it or only that. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. So the uh, question was on the, the two pie the two pie charts. Um, the the one on the left was the initial hit of the page with the, the whole weight of the page, and the one on the right was the um, using the expires header okay. that it didn't even ask for those those elements again because the the browser the user's browser already had that. Good question. Did I see another? Yeah, on, on the caching aspect, do we have to take into consideration whether it's a static, static page or dynamic? So the question was, do we, do we have to take into account what is a static versus a, a dynamic page? Right, right. So with, with Cold Fusion and with um, PHP, you just put it at the top of the page, and it, it doesn't matter if it's static, dynamic. It's, it's um, caching the entire, everything that, that's on that page. With .NET, I put this inside of the static content, and you can specify what stuff is static and not other places in your web config. Um, but by, by default, it, it looks for CSS, JavaScript, and, and images that, that, are, that, are, that you're delivering statically. Does that answer your question? Yes. So you, you can specify if you want to, but this is the quick and dirty, easiest, fastest, you, you, know, you can write it before you leave today. Okay. Good question. Anything else? All right, so we... We started with this, where you have where all these requests are coming into your application server. The application server is sending all of those database requests to the database, and then the responses come back. With the database caching, we made it only hit the database once, and with the expires header, we made the second request to that page only ask for it once. So your database server and your ac your application server can now handle all those spikes that are happening at the beginning of the semester or when an assignment comes in without crashing your server and without needing huge amounts of uh, infrastructure to handle them. So how so what are the tools that we use to uh, find what where these improvements can be made? The first one we use is a mini profiler for, for .NET. If you're writing .NET code um, now, go download Mini Profiler today. This is going to immediately improve all of your web pages, what, the, what information is shown. And the information that's shown is for each function that's hit inside of your, a, a page, it tells you what the duration of that particular function is and what queries, what queries were ran for that particular function. It also goes into uh, what are the duplicate queries. So if you have some content where you're, where you're calling the same query mo multiple times in a page or the same uh, query with different query um, parameters, Mini Profiler will say, hey, look, there's a better, more efficient way to be writing this query. You should look into that because it's slowing your page down. 
Uh, another thing I like about Mini Profiler is it comes in a NuGet package. So for you .NET developers, it's very easy to install and use. I saw got the uh, Tiger Woods going on back there. Um, it's very easy to install and upgrade and use, and it just it's very very easy. It's made by the guys that built Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange. So as a developer, if you're not using Stack Overflow right now, when you have problems, you should start using Stack Overflow. When you have problems, the the experts all over the world come in and answer your question and like 15 minutes instead of you beating your head against your computer for two hours trying to figure something out. So it's so it you know it's it's useful. And the other great thing about Mini Profiler is it is it can be ran in a production environment. This isn't something that only has to be ran in testing. You can set up Mini Profiler to only show up for particular IP addresses or people that have specific rights within your application. Uh, you can set really it to show up for whoever you want and not show up for your regular users. So the, the same way that ASP.NET has mini profiler, ColdFusion has a CF settings tag with an attribute of show debug output. And what this show debug output does is it, after your page is rendered, puts all of the, the pieces of the page, all the function calls, all the includes, all the CFC hits, um, and how long each of them take, as well as all the query, queries and how long the queries took on that particular page. Again, saves you a lot of time when you're debugging and your page is running slowly and you don't know why, which piece within the page is running slowly. PHP doesn't have something similar that I could find, and here, here are some uh, things that were recommended to me by others. Uh, do any of you PHP developers out there have uh, debugging um, libraries or extensions that they, that they use or have found helpful? XPBug? All right. Got, I got it. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so, th so those are so those are one tool. So those are some of the tools we use in our development. Another tool we use is SQL Server Profiler. So all the Oracle or MongoDB folks, I'm sorry, I don't have an example for that. But if you're using SQL Server, you have this profiler tool that is essentially a trace of everything that happens on your database. So every connection that's made, every query that's ran, every stored procedure, everything that happens in a database while this is running, it records. And you can save it to a file. You can just watch it as it's happening. Or what we do on our team is we save the, the, those results to a database. When we save all, those, all the queries that were ran to a database, we can go and see, well, what queries were ran the most or what queries took the longest to run? Yes. Called what? It's called clear trace. Clear trace? And it uh, aggregates that data for you. Okay. So it will say 350 times we ran frog get data. Okay. So uh, here at Penn State, they use a tool called clear trace. Uh, is, it on, is it for SQL Server? It's for SQL Server. It takes your saved uh, profiler file, mm -hmm. uh, your PRC file for profiler, okay. and aggregates the data. Very good. Really cool. Thank you for sharing. So what? So what's what's great? What's great about this data from ClearTrace or the from these queries here are these are the ones that you can spend your most time the, the most time on um, to cache. So it immediately tells you, well, these are the ones that I should be caching because they're ran the most on my site or they're taking the most time when users are hitting my pages. So it's these are the ones that will improve um, the page the most. So for the least amount of time as a developer, you can get the most return for your end user. It's always great, right? LoadStorm is a load testing tool. Um, it's we we started out. Oh, Matt was just asking about with the SQL profiler. We use that. It creates a file that you can then use in that index tuning wizard in SQL Server, which seems to help the databases. Do you use that or we anything to add? we have so the so the the, the question or comment is that. Uh, when you get the profiler data, um, he uses a, a, a tool called tu the tuning profiler. Well, SQL Server has an, SQL, index tuning wizard. an index tuning wizard to help improve the, the, the query functionality. Yeah, I was just wondering if you use that also. We, we do not use that particular function, but there are other f functions within SQL Server that we use to improve individual queries uh, performance. Yeah. Thank you. So with LoadStorm, uh, we started out by using it 
for its free 25 simultaneous users, and what we found was that was enough to get us started. If we threw 25 users banging away at our site for half an hour, we could e easily find what pages um, were the slowest and uh, what 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 pages we need to we need to spend our time on. We found it to be so easy to use and so helpful that we actually um, use it for our, our larger load testing when we, when we go up to 100, 200, 300, 500 users at a time. Um, but if you just want to get started, try it. It's free for 25 users. It's very easy to use, very easy to get set up and going, and it produces great reports that are good not only for you, but you can give to your, your manager, your director, and say, hey, look, here's the before and after. So the top one is the before. Um, we, we ran it and stepped up the number of users from 5 to 10 to 20 to 30 on up the line. And what you can see is that we started having errors, which are the, the, the red spikes. And this line here at the top is the maximum request time. So it, it's actually timing out for, most of, for a lot of the requests. When we implemented, this is actually the results from the, the mixable one I showed earlier. Um, when we implemented the, those, those 6 or 10, I don't remember, 6 or 10 cache queries, all of our errors went away. And the, the average request time for a page went down to, you can't even see it, it's so close to zero, it's about half a second down there. So it provides, you know, you, when, when, your, when your boss comes and says, why are you spending your time doing this instead of building this new functionality, you first say, performance is a functionality that we need to pay attention to. And then next you can say, this is, this is why I want to do it, so that you don't have these angry students coming and talking to you when something goes wrong. It also tells you, uh, gives you a, a breakdown of the pages that were hit, how many times your pages were hit, and uh, the average response time. So this is after we implemented some caching for a different app. It, you can see all of our pages now were, under, were, were well under a second. And that's, we like to use that one second as a kind of barrier to say if it's, if it's over a second, it's something we really need to look into. And if it's under a second, then we're OK with it for now. The last tools I want to share are browser extensions that you can install, uh, Yahoo's YSlow and Google's PageSpeed. Does anybody use those already, already now? Yeah, yeah. If you're not, you, you really should. You can check out your own site. You can check out anybody else's site. Um, they, they, are, they just run in the browser, and they show a wealth of information, not only about what's, how your site can be improved um, for, with caching and with other things, um, but it tells you how to, and how, how to actually improve them. So Yahoo's YSlow and uh, Google's PageSpeed. Well, with that, that's all I've got to share with you today. If you want to learn about any of the tools I talked about, Purdue.edu slash studio, and I'll take any questions. Did you, did you ever feel like you had to take the cache off the web server box itself? So the question was, did we ever feel that we had to take our cache off the web server box? So that's an interesting question. <laughs> Um, yes. So with anything, as, as you're storing that cache, you need some place to store it on your application server. And uh, what, what we had to do was because we have two, two application servers, um, we're actually using Memcached, Memcached D. And uh, what it does is it, it provides a central location to store your, your caching data um, so that you're not doubling up when you have multiple uh, Server, a server farm, you're not saving the same thing on every single server, Memcached handles that for you. But as a simple place to start, right. you can start here, but as you get more advanced, then something like Memcached would, okay. would, be, nice. would be appropriate. Yes? When you were talking database, uh, caching PHP, for example, earlier, um, were you talking that example of that using a PHP built-in caching functionality for that database, or were you going to that, that's actually using the built-in PHP functionality. All, all of what I showed here, you don't need anything extra to do. It's a very much get started. I can, you can probably before the next session starts, uh, improve your site. Any other questions? Thank you for your attention. <laughs>